Hi folks, this is um, going to be the very first part of chapter one in the um, Pierce genetics text for the Agra 305 class. Um, and so today as we start working through chapter one, you're going to see a series of four different um, lectures that are going to be posted as YouTube video links, and they're going to be about 10 minutes in length. Um, so it's uh, it'll be a good length to stop and take a break in between. Um, and then you'll also find the lecture in a PDF form on the, um, on the learning module as well. So let's go ahead and jump right into chapter number one, which is all about inter the introduction of genetics. And what I really want you guys to get out of this first chapter is, um, is to really get a good grasp on the importance of genetics and how it has really determined um, some of the phenotypes and some of the characteristics and agricultural uh, commodities and products that we see today. We're also going to go through um, some of the history related to genetics because um, the history is going to be very, very important, especially when it comes to transmission genetics. And it's really going to dictate how we um, utilize genetic technology today. And then finally, our last major objective for chapter one is to uh, revisit and then master genetic um, terminology. So that'll be the fourth uh, lecture. So um, the outline for chapter one is shown here on this slide. I'm not going to go through it all, but basically we're going to start with um, what genetics is and we're going to end with uh, the review of ge uh, basic genetic concepts. So genetics can be divided into three different divisions, transmission, molecular, and population. Transmission genetics is going to be what we term as classical genetics. So this is how traits are passed on from one generation to the next, so how parents pass on their traits. So when you think about yourself um, individually, you may have traits that may have come from mom, or you may have traits that come from dad. And so the way that we study those genes and how they're passed from one generation to the next is the discipline of transmission genetics. The discipline of molecular genetics is uh, very, very different because this is where we're actually looking at the chemical nature of a gene. So a gene is going to be a location on a chromosome that codes for a specific trait. And the way that we study molecular genetics is, um, is rapidly adva advancing today. So we've gone from just um, selecting individuals or certain um, phenotypes of crops for one particular trait to actually being able to sequence the entire genome of those species. So we're able to use um, bioinformatics to target um, specific genes of interest. And finally, the third major division of uh, genetics is population genetics, and this is exactly what it says. So it's studying the, pot, the genetics that are associated with a certain population. So population could be anything from all of the people in the entire world, to your family, to a field of crops, or to an entire species of crops. So um, Population genetics really looks at how individual plants or animals or people um, change over time. And this is the area of genetics that has a lot of statistics applied to it. So when we look at transmission genetics in the most classical sense, we can um, um, a really good example of this is outlined in the in chapter number one is the Hopi Indian tribe from Arizona. So they had individuals that had phenotypes or physical appearances of blue eyes, very, very light or white skin, and um, blonde, almost white hair. And they, um, through a lot of transmission genetics um, and a lot of population genetics, they were to, able to identify that this is actually a gene, that a recessive gene um, located on chromosome 15. And the reason that this phenotype was preserved in the Hopi tribe is because these individuals that had these um, characteristics were viewed as special. So they were the ones um, that were lifted up in the tribe. They um, had the opportunity to reproduce more often than other individuals in the tribe because there was a special place of emphasis put on them. So because they had more opportunities at reproductive success, that proliferated the um, phenotype within the tribe. 
The albinism gene is not unique to humans. We also see it in many, many other species. So we've got our white zebras, chimpanzees, tigers, squirrels, and um, I don't ever, ever, ever want to come across a, uh, an albino alligator, but I, I guess that there are those as well. So the reason that this condition happens is because the gene that's located on chromosome 15 actually um, results in its inability to produce melanin. And melanin is um, allows pigmentation to actually fill the cell, the skin cells, as well as the hair cells. Um, and so if melanin is not produced, um, and melanin is a protein, so if it doesn't, if that gene does not code for the correct amount of um, protein material, when that gene is turned on or goes through transcription and translation, it's not going to produce enough of this protein. Therefore, the hair follicle um, is not going to be allowed to absorb any color, and neither are the skin cells or the retina cells. So these individuals end up with the white skin, white hair, and blue eyes phenotype, which we term albinism. And this is just, keep in mind, this is just one gene on chromosome 15. Many of the traits that we deal with today, especially in agriculture, are polygenic uh, traits, meaning that there's many genes that determine their phenotype. This is a simply inherited trait, albinism. Molecular genetics, or the second major division of genetics, is where um, we start to look at the chemical nature of a gene. So we've been able to do lots and lots of screen testing, um, taking DNA samples and se sequencing that data, determining at exactly where on the chromosome that that gene is located and associating it to specific conditions. So this um, is an example of arthritis. So we can see up here, um, in the first two pictures, on the left we've got a normal hand, and then on the right we have um, a hand that actually has severe arthritis, and that is because of a deformity on a gene on chromosome 5. And so we've been able to utilize molecular genetics to really study that gene and determine exactly what its, uh, its DNA sequence is. And this is one of the conditions that we can now go back in and treat with gene therapy. And finally, population genetics is studying the allelic or genotypic frequency and evolution in a population. So we can um, look at things such as natural selection, mutations, um, how the gene flows from one generation to the next, and genetic drift. And population genetics is really the study of how individuals adapt to their environment. So let's do a brief overview of genetics now. So as we look at genetics, um, we've got fossil records that go clear back to at least 4 billion years of history. So that's, how, that's about as far back as our carbon dating is um, that is really, really sound. So in this 4 billion year history, um, we've noticed over time through fossil records that there has been a basis for evolution. So Mother Nature has her own way of selecting individuals that are the most fit, and this has happened since the dawn of time. So one example of this is the wildebeests um, in Central or in um, Central Africa, so South Central Africa, and this is um, is really becoming quite um, a, a tragedy. So these wildebeests are slowly becoming as extinct, and a lot of it has to do because of um, their environment and their ecosystems are changing, so there's less land available for them to gather nutrients and resources to continue to proliferate their species. So wildebeests um, are um, are looking are trying to be conserved in zoos and preservations right now, um, but this is just one of those. Um, phenomenon that Mother Nature has decided, okay, wildebeest, uh, you have done your duty on Earth and you're slowly moving out. So the reasons for that is um, become can become quite conflicted. 
So one of the big reasons that we see very few wildebeest um, left is what we term natural selection, so predation. Um, so baby calves are not uh, given adequate chance. They're threatened with predation. Um, the more predative uh, species are starting to move into these ecosystems, and so the wildebeest doesn't really have a good, safe home range anymore. So as we look at genetics on a historical basis, um, we know that, um, that DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is really the core of genetics. And DNA is a universal genetic code. And when we study GNA through evolutional history and evolutionary biology, we um, have found that the Earth evolved from a primordial ancestor between three and a half and four billion years ago, so a very long time. So Charles Dawkins, who is um, a pretty pronounced uh, evolutionist today, uh, really describes DNA as um, a river that runs through time. So it connects our primordial species from three and a half to four billion years ago with us today. So this common substance called DNA um, is going to be contained in many, many different species, um, or really in all of our species, and that means really good things for science. So it actually allows us to study bacteria, which have very small genomes, and apply those findings to individuals with large genomes. So very, um, for example, E. coli um, has one chromosome, it's circular. And we can study E. coli and determine um, things about similar sequences in our DNA. Um, and we have 30 chromosomes. So here's just a few facts um, about genetics, and I'll let you guys read through these. But one of the most uh, interesting, especially since I'm an animal scientist, um, is that cows um, actually are 80% genetically similar to humans. So that means that um, the cow genome uh, is 80% um, similar to humans. So they have um, a lot of the same uh, genes that are going to be expressed. And the reason that they're expressed um, may be different, but the, uh, actually the DNA that is there is very, very close to humans. All right, so let's talk really briefly about genetic models. Um, genetic models are going to be animals or plants that are used to study uh, genomic trends or conditions and phenotypes. So one example of this is that the zebrafish, which is a very small fish, was created to study how um, pigmentation in humans actually um, occurred. So they, the zebrafish were um, developed by the University of Pennsylvania and they, um, researchers there, did, um, created a genetic mutant that has light pigmentation and this is due to um, less as well as smaller pigment containing structures called melanosomes. And so they use this model of normal zebrafish versus golden mutant uh, zebrafish to study a specific gene and that's that SLC24A5 um, gene. And this gene really dictates the type of pigmentation in humans uh, or that humans are going to have. So whether they're white, Hispanic, black, you name it. So um, the, this gene really lends itself to um, how intensely pigmented those melanosomes will be. So we can study zebrafish to um, actually help us better understand humans. So this slide really just shows a few genetic model organisms um, that have been used extensively for genetic analysis and studying um, uh, higher ranking individuals. So nematodes, we study a lot, especially on the plant science side. Um, house mice um, are studied a lot as well. Arabidopsis down here um, at, the, at the bottom here, this is like the golden um, child of the plant world. So anything that's published about plant genetics really goes back to Arabidopsis. So these are just a few genetic model organisms, um, and they become uh, very, or they um, are going to be utilized as a genetic model, model organism for a couple of different reasons. They have an easily sequ uh, sequenceable 
uh, genome. They also have a really fast generation interval, so they could have um, offspring very quickly. And, um, and that is going to be the two major reasons why these uh, genetic organisms are going to be good for studying genetic models. All right, so that is the end of part A. We'll see you guys for part B.